Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the fifth meeting in 2017 of the Rural Economy and Connectivity Committee. Uh, before we go into the first item on the agenda, can I remind everyone present, please, to switch off their mobile phones? Uh, no apologies have been received. Agenda item one is the committee is asked to decide whether it will take items four and five in private. This is to consider a draft report on crofting and discuss the committee's response to the PO's commission on parliamentary reform. Are all members agreed? Yes. That's agreed. We're moving on to agenda item two. The second item on our agenda this morning is to take evidence on the Scottish Government's draft climate change plan, RPP3. The draft plan was laid on the 20th of January 2017 and the Scottish Parliament has a period of 60 days to consent the document. The committee will be carrying out this scrutiny in collaboration with the three other committees Last week, we focused on agriculture and forestry. This morning, we're going to look at climate, climate change in relation to transport. Now, I would like to welcome Professor Tom Rye, who, who is uh, the director of TRI and the professor of transport policy at Edinburgh and Napier University. We've, we've met before. Uh, David Beaton, the managing director of Urban Foresight. Uh, Sally Hinchcliffe, an organizer of Pedal on Parliament. Uh, Phil Matthews, Chair of the Transform Scotland, and Dr. Jason Monios, Associate Professor in Transport Planning and Geography at Edinburgh uh, U Napier University. Now, during the course, uh, the course of this morning, uh, you'd, I would like to remind you, you don't have to push any buttons. The gentleman on your left and my right uh, will be watching and will ensure that your microphone is activated. If you'd like to come in, I will try and get you all in if you indicate. Um, you need to indicate to me or uh, Steve Farrell, the, the clerk, or indeed the Deputy Convener, Gail Ross, and, we, and we'll try and make sure we don't miss anyone. Um, so, uh, I think the most important thing is that you leave here at the end of this uh, meeting is to feel that you've had a chance to feed in your thoughts. So the first question uh, this morning is going to come from John. Uh, thank you, Kadvina. Uh, good morning, panel. Uh, can I have your views, please, on the modelling undertaken to support the transport element of the climate change plan, please? So who'd like to go first on that? Uh, you're all ducking responsibility <laughs> while you gather your yeah, thoughts. I Tom, you... you, you I can say, I'll say a little bit. I'm, I'm not an expert on transport modelling. Uh, what I would say is that the, uh, the transport model in terms of surface transport is based obviously on uh, traffic forecasts um, and those traffic forecasts are kind of treated um, as, as of something that can't be influenced. So they're, they're sort of a given. Um, and I, I don't, I have indeed discussed with Transport Scotland at one of their modelling events that that isn't necessarily a very helpful approach because one might wish to start from the point of view that what, what is the level of traffic that we wish to have and therefore um, what do we need to do to achieve that level of traffic. In addition, um, that there is only one, as I understand it from looking at the, at the, the report and the supporting information, there is only one uh, traffic forecast assumed. Whereas if you look at the UK national traffic forecasts, uh, there, are, there are five different um, scenarios uh, in, the, in the UK national forecast. And, um, in relation to those, the Transport Scotland assumption, which I think is a 27% growth between 2015 and 2030, is on the high side. So um, I, I have some, some problems with that, which I've just summarised. So yeah. I can't say anything else about the, te the modelling techniques because I don't know sufficient. Sally, you... Well, just one thing that stood out for me, I didn't really follow the, the full details of the model, but when I looked at the, the outline of it, they, um, they divide it up into mode of transport, um, and there was nothing active. Tra yeah. Active travel was not considered at all, which made me wonder whether you know that had any uh, the impact of, of increased cycling or increased walking had actually been taken into account at all, because there didn't seem to be any evidence that, it, that from from the model as, as presented in the plan that that it had been included. Does anyone else want to come in? I noticed Tom's had a sort of subsequent thought about it. Do you want to? Sorry, sorry. <laughs> yeah, you can disagree with me early on if you like. You may <laughs> not get in again. Apologies. <laughs> Tom. Yeah, it was just to clarify uh, Sally's point there. From talking to uh, a modeler, my understanding is that um, the demand the demand matrices, the level of the de overall demand in the model is reduced 
depending on assumptions made about active travel. So if, for example, the model says that there's a 1,000 trips in total, but an assumption is made that then 30% of those trips will be made by active travel, those trips are removed from what are called the demand matrices of the model, and so there are only 700 trips that are then modelled We're using um, motorised modes of transport. That's um, how it works, I, I believe, in, in simple terms. John, just before I bring you back in, Stuart's got a, 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 a small question, I think, there. Yeah, well, small question, it may be a big answer. Um, I, I, I just wondered to what extent this whole system has a, a feedback loop in that if you decide what the traffic volume is going to be and you build to support it, you create an environment that almost creates that traffic. And, and, and the question might be, if it, it was an unconstrained view, in other words, your, your underlying assumption was there were no constraints on how people could use various transport modes, would the answers be different from the approach that I know we take, which is actually a constrained view? I, and I just give as an example that the new fourth crossing is designed to have a capacity which is essentially the same as the bridge that it's replacing. But the unconstrained demand for crossing the fourth might be something quite different. Now, it's perfectly possible, reasonable in public policy terms, to use what you implement as a constraint. But I just wonder how the feedback, and I don't have an answer, how the feedback loop between these two things working, and, and is it working the right way? And is more to the point in relation to, we're talking about climate change here, are we using it in a way that's actually helpful to the agenda that we're discussing today? J Jason, is that, on traffic planning, is that something you would feel you'd want to come in on? No, I don't really have anything to add to what John okay. said on that, on the modelling front. David. Well, I think maybe taking a step back and then, then coming to the point, I think, broadly speaking, a kind of robust evidence-based approach to exploring some of these challenges and coming up with answers to them I think is a good thing, and I think that, that that's worthy of, of, of note. Um, I think the issues of growing... Uh, transport are clearly linked to anticipated growth in population and the economy. And again, when government policy is is planning for that future, I think it's important that transport policy kind of mirrors that as well. Um, I think it's a good point. Yeah, if you build it, well, they will come type approach. You know, we build more roads, we'll get more traffic. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Um, there is also the constrained economy aspect of not building these things, which is the you know continuing tension. Um, I think one of the things that the, the climate change plan does address is that there will be some catalytic measures that will have a, a significant impact on trips, things like low emission zones, um, th that you know will hopefully bring about the kind of transformation that we would like to see in the future. Um, so yeah, it, it's it's kind of a joined up way of looking at some of these, these challenges and opportunities, I think. Just before, if I could just ask a wee question. Low emission zones are of course about pollution rather than climate change primarily is that correct in your understanding um the motivations are largely driven by air quality but yeah. the consequence could be that there are fewer okay. journeys within cities which has a climate change benefit. that's right thank you but sally wanted to come in and then i'll take tom then i'd like to go back to john to develop this line of thought if i yeah. may so sorry sally well just to say um we are in Scotland planning to increase the road capacity quite significantly with the A9 duelling and so, and so on. And that will, every model seems to show that that increases motorised transport. Equally, the more cycling infrastructure, for instance, you build, the more cycling you get. So it works both ways. You can use it. Um, it's, a, it's a sword you can use in both directions. Okay, Tom, do you want... A specific point on low emission zones. Um, low emission zones that have been implemented elsewhere in Europe have led to a faster... Um, turn out a faster renewal of the local fleet, local vehicle fleet, than um, areas outside the low emission zones, which of course has had an impact on fuel efficiency and then therefore climate change, as well as on local pollution. So they have that benefit. Uh, in specific regard to the question about 
sort of um, <coughs> our assumptions and our constrained demand and so on with regard to modelling. Um, all I would say is there's been a tradition, obviously, of uh, tending to model on the basis of predicting the amount of traffic and then providing for it, uh, although I, um, I accept um, Mr. Stevenson's point that uh, sometimes we will, con we will model for constrained demand as well. But I think there are, there are, our modelling tools still aren't um, as sophisticated as they could be. Uh, perhaps they'll never be sufficiently sophisticated, and therefore that's why I advocate the approach of thinking about scenarios, where would we like to be, and therefore what do we need to do to get to where we want to be. There is a danger otherwise that we do end up in this kind of loop that Mr. Stevenson, uh, Stevenson alluded to. John, would you, sorry, can I just bring John in here, because there's a sort of second thread to this. I'm Thank you, yes. uh, thanks, Kavita. It, it is, uh, you know, about the transport section of the, the, the plan and the scrutiny that organisations like yourself and parliamentarians are obliged to give it. Given that the transport modelling was influenced by research carried out by consultants um, Element Energy for Transport Scotland, which was only published last Tuesday, can we meaningfully scrutinise that plan? Um, who'd like to lead on that? Are you all comfortable that you haven't had a chance to scrutinise it, or, or do you all feel that you've had a chance to scrutinise it? It's rather, rather a leading question, I think. <laughs> go for it, then. Well, t Tom, go for it. Are you referring to the report on the potential for greenhouse gas emissions from uh, vehicle technology? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, the, 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 the report last week by Element um, Energy. Yeah, yeah. That, that one, yeah. I had an attempt to, I made an attempt to scrutinise it. <laughs> and and how did you get on? Well, <clears throat> um, the Element Energy report, report, if we're talking about the same report, the one that I read uh, was looking at the, the scope, well, the, the potential of low emission vehicles and how big the market for low emission vehicles could be. Um, and <clears throat> it's on this basis that some of the predictions about the impacts of low emission vehicles in, in, in the climate change plan have, 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 been, have been made. Um, and I was a, a, little bit, a little bit concerned because the Element Energy report for, the, for Transport Scotland, um, it says that um, a th a basically in-kind support, in-kind and cash support of about a thousand pounds per vehicle purchase will lead to by 2030, a 40% market share for um, plug-in hybrid electric vehicles and battery electric vehicles. So 40% in total would be low emission by 2030, based on the idea that you would give people a combination of incentives, uh, say free parking, but also maybe some cash incentives to, to, to buy um, uh, such a vehicle. But um, similar work that was carried out by the same consultants um, for the Climate Change Commission um, predicted that by 2030, for the UK as a whole, it would require £3,000 of cost support in kind of cash to achieve a 60% market share for the same type of vehicles. Um, so I'm not saying that either is wrong, but what I think would have been helpful is if the CIS climate change plan and indeed Element <laughs> Energy's work that was published last Tuesday could have had a, a range of predictions of take-up of of these low emission vehicles, which I think would be in line with other research that's been done. I mean, there are so many imponderables in the take up of low emission vehicles that it would be safer to say, well, we'll have a kind of low take up scenario and what does that do to our climate change targets and our achievement of our climate change targets versus a high take up scenario. And I, 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 don't, see, I don't see that in the, in the work at the moment. Um, also, I, it would have been good to have a little bit more comparison or refer, reference to what has actually been achieved in those countries that do have a high level of take up of electric vehicles. And I didn't totally see that in Element Energy's report, but I didn't have much time to give it full scrutiny. Um, that's interesting in the sense that I'm not noticing anyone else putting their hand up. Well, David, you want to come in, sorry. Um, I'm, a, I'm a little bit sympathetic, actually, because I know how, um, how much work has gone on behind the scenes. and. Um, I know that the report is perhaps does not entirely reflect the sum of all the analysis and work that has taken place to, to reach the conclusions and uh, the points um, which have been made in, in the climate change plan. Um, I think an important point to consider is the rate of technological change in, in this area. The fact that you know battery prices for electric vehicles um, are radically decreasing and are expected to you know decrease exponentially over the next few years. We don't really know how much how quickly that will happen. Certainly government ha doesn't have any direct control over that. Um, it's very much dependent on industry um, expertise for that. 
Um, we also don't know how markets will develop. And um, again, a lot of the incentives to um, promote widespread adoption of ultra low emission vehicles are not necessarily within the gift of national government. They are you know, largely the responsibility of local authorities <coughs> and um, perhaps other commercial partners that can incentivize adoption of, of these vehicles. So it is a, is a very complex area. Um, you know, I know from, from doing work in that area myself that you, know, you, can, you can come up with a forecast one day and the six months later you know, everything will have completely changed. So I have some sympathy for that. Sorry, P Peter would like to come in and then I'll come back to you, Jonathan. <coughs> Yeah, I mean, it's just to explore a wee bit more. You, you just said the, the batteries for, for these cars are, are, are increasing in value uh, at, a, at a rapid rate. You know, I just wonder how sustainable this, this whole idea of going electric cars is. You know, if it, go, if it goes worldwide and, and you know, 90% of the cars in the world are, are going to be battery powered, are there enough elements in the world to, to produce the batteries, you know, and the nickel and the cadmium and whatever else is used? Are we going down a blind alley here and that we're going to run out of these basic elements to produce um, the battery? No, that's a huge I question. I, I, I don't want to preempt uh, the answers, and, I, and, and I'm just going to say we've got a whole tranche on, on, on questions on, on battery technology oh. later in the session. Can just do and it it's now? very interesting, <laughs> and, and I'd like, if I may, to be very rude and say that I'm not going to let them answer that question until we, till we get to that section, just okay. so I can keep it straight. John, do you want to come back on it? Yes. Thank you. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm still going to be flogging on about this plan and because our job is to scrutinise and explain to, to others where we get with things. Do you have concerns about the constraints placed on the, on the model by policy makers, the lack of detail about policy measures that were rejected and the reasons for choosing to do so? And if I can throw one into the mix there, um, uh, Professor, I talked about where we'd like to be. An aspiration for many people is a 20 mile an hour uh, limit in residential areas. I don't know if you could comment on that, but in, perhaps as an example. Who'd like to lead on that? Well, Sally. To, 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 take, um, to, to answer your original, uh, the, the first part about the lack of detail in some cases, I mean, one of the things we were noticing is that there are very few figures in the, in the report compared with the last iteration in, two, in 2013, which had, you know, for each measure, it had, you know, how much reduction was expected and how much it would cost. And, and that seems to have gone largely from, from the report as published in, in this iteration. Um, some of the reasons given I found in the, um, particularly the one on active travel, which seemed to talk only about walking journeys under one mile, seemed to completely ignore the, you know, issue of the sort of um, two to five kilometer journeys, which is the sort of area where you can see the most growth in bikes and, 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 and the most potential for a switch to active travel and where we've modeled potentially quite significant savings to carbon emissions. but. It would be really interesting to see the government figures on that because, because you know, this is just calculations that we're doing as, you know, as ourselves. It's, it's not anything official. So it did feel very undetailed compared to the 2013 iteration, I think. Okay, F Phil, you'd like to come in and then Jason afterwards. Yeah, uh, first of all, I'd just echo a lot of what Sally's just said there. I mean, I think the, the lack of detail, lack of quantification of individual policies and proposals is, is disappointing. Um, I mean, take a step back, first of all, I think as with energy, as with waste, with transport, the way you should approach this is to think of in terms of hierarchy of actions. So first is to reduce the need to travel. Second is to look for the right modes, the more sustainable modes. And the last bit is really to look for more benign technical fixes and so on down the line. And it seems that this, uh, th this whole uh, approach to transport is very much front loaded on the on the techie fix uh, uh, electric vehicle side of things, which is certainly going to be very important, but it's not the whole picture. And um, I think our frustration is just that, uh, as you said, this is 27% increase predicted in, in road travel and so on. Uh, there are all sorts of other government targets around cycling, where, where we're not seeing any progress at all towards 10% target. There are all sorts of uh, other government aspirations about public health around social inclusion and so on. And we seem very much fixated in this on the electric vehicle side of things, rather than measures which would actually help deliver better places to live, deliver uh, more sustainable cities. So I think, I think, as Sally was saying, I think there's a lack of detail, and there's also a lack of really putting this in the context of the wider government aspirations, uh, socio-economic and environmental aspirations as well. Jason, I'd like to bring you in, if I may. Yes, yeah, so just building or agreeing with those two previous comments and building on them a little bit. Uh, a lot of the policy measures proposed here are all haven't been decided yet that we're going to try and negotiate emission standards and negotiate 
uh, excise duty differentials, negotiate biofuels policies. We're going to look into low emission zones and see if we can potentially have a pilot in 2018. So a lot of these things actually haven't been decided yet. And if you haven't done that, then you, you can't model them because you, you don't know if you're actually going to do them or not. So, it's, so it's, there's probably a link between the lack of detail and lack of quantitative figures and targets. Uh, well, that's linked to the, the fact that some of these policies haven't actually uh, been agreed or decided yet. So therefore, how can you even, even model them? David, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, well, I mean, just to quickly address that point, I think it does come down to what government can say will definitely happen. Mm. So government cannot say we will definitely have a low emission zone because mm. that's a locally administered decision. And, you know, government can encourage that, but isn't in a place to make it happen. I think in terms of um, the, 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 the transport hierarchy, um, I think it's, that's obviously it's it's an uh, under underpinning principle to all transport planning and transport policy but this is a this is a climate change plan and i think when you're looking at how you achieve decarbonisation of transport you have to be realistic about the contribution that different modes can make and you know cycling is not going to bring about a radical decarbonisation of transport anytime soon um, whereas if you look at you know i think it's over 60% of journeys in scotland are by car so naturally, if you want to make a serious dent in, in, um, in carbon emissions, you're going to have to concentrate on, on that mode to a large extent. I think that's true, but if, you, if you're basing your forecast, sorry. Sorry, sorry Phil, Phil, do come in, and then I'm, I'm sorry, going to go to Sally. If you could just catch my eye, just so I can yes. sort of try to manage everyone's expectations, uh, that would be I, fine. I think that's right. I, I said, as I said, I wasn't discounting the, the role that electric vehicles can play. I think, um, as has been alluded to, though, as well, we, we, the, the more traffic growth increases, and part of that is based on transport decisions that are taken now in terms of road building, et cetera, over-investment in other modes, and so on. So the, the higher rate of uh, demand uh, growth that you have for road transport, the more challenging those targets become. So I think the two, the two are related. Decisions made in infrastructure spend, decisions made on how transport is managed in cities directly feed into demand for road traffic. Um, it's also true, as people are saying, we're not sure exactly when electric vehicles and ultra-low emission vehicle technologies are really going to kick in in a big way. We have air quality, major air quality challenges now. We have congestion challenges now. We have all sorts of things now. And w w we seem to be basing things on things which may, may happen somewhere down the line, 10, 15 years down the line, rather than action which we should be thinking about now. And also thinking, I think government should be about joined up thinking. It should, of course, this is about climate change. But government is also about delivering policy in the round and thinking about how things fit together. And so if climate change action is not necessarily also meeting other targets, which are good around public health, then, then that's something that the climate change plan should be thinking about in some way as well. Okay, and, and, and that's a, a very good link into the next question, but I know Sally wanted to come in briefly, if I may. Yeah, oh, just, just to say, I mean, yes, a large number of... 60% of journeys are by car, but some of those are very short journeys. So if we're just going to give up and say, well, actually, let people drive under two miles, let's just leave it like that, then we're digging a big hole for ourselves, and the electric cars have got further to go, if you like, to save us. Whereas uh, we can start to build for bicycles now, bikes are here now, um, and it's completely under the control of the Scottish Government. So it's, it's something that we can get going with, and then further down the line, better low emissions vehicles can come in and pick up the slack of the, for the longer journeys. Okay, uh, I think, John, are you ha happy that you... Uh, I made brief reference to 20 mile an hour because we, we, we talked about, it, it seems to me to be it's more of the same and then do we have to look at simply about the mitigation rather than trying to change patterns of behaviour? I wonder if the 20 mile an hour is an example of something where air quality... Um, okay, now, that, 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 that's... Almost a different question, but, but I, I'm happy, very brief answers, if I may, because I'd quite like to go on to this whole issue of target setting, if I may. Sorry, uh, Tom, do you want to lead? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the, the 20 mile an hour zone issue is something that's more related to safety, obviously, and, and local traffic, and may not have that much of an impact on, on climate change, um, simply because it doesn't have much of an impact on fuel consumption. If anything, it possibly pushes up fuel consumption, but it really, really depends on where the traffic redistributes to or whether it actually reduces the total number of vehicle trips. Um, in, in terms of your wider question about, you know, is there enough detail in here? Do we, can we understand how the modelling has been done? I, I, I would say um, 
I wouldn't expect a huge amount of detail in a strategic document, but I would expect more, more detail in appendices and maybe uh, uh, link, links to data sets and, and so on, so that we can see how the working has been carried out. Um, <clears throat> and I would also expect um, uh, a little bit more detail about the implementability of many of the proposals that, that, that are policies and proposals that are, that are listed here because it's not only well you, you could make an assumption that they are implemented and they will have an effect but then there's also the issue can you implement them and to be honest quite a lot of these these things that are listed have serious implementation difficulties and it would be helpful in scrutinizing the document if that could also be looked at or raised. unless anyone's got anything specifically <coughs> different to that i'd like to leave that there if i may john if, thank you if that's right and thank and I'd like to go to John. You've got some question on targets, I think, that uh, I think leads neatly into what was okay. discussed earlier. Thanks, Convener. Uh, I mean, if I can link two things together, i.e. looking back and looking forward, you can maybe combine them because I think they are linked to each other. I mean, how do you feel uh, we have done since the previous plan, RPP2? You know, have we really achieved what we should have achieved? And then linked to that, really, are the targets that are being set realistic for the next uh, 15 years up to 2032? Um, are they over-ambitious? Are they under-ambitious? Or is it not as simple as that? Phil, you were mentioning targets, so I'm afraid you're coming in first. Right, uh, okay. Um, I, I think <coughs> looking, looking back all the way to 1990, transport is the one major area where we've seen very little reduction in emissions. That's obviously very disappointing because, as I was saying before, it's a, it's a large part of our emissions, so it should we should be seeing significant reductions, and the significant reductions in transport would actually lead to, I would argue, a whole range of wider benefits for Scotland, health benefits, socioeconomic benefits, environmental benefits as well. So I think that's been poor. In terms of the targets looking forward, you know, the 30-odd 30, 30 percent by the early 2030s, I think that's a, a reasonable ambition. It's, it's a, a, a realistic ambition uh, for the sector. But as people have said already, I think it's, um, it's, it's very much predicated on a range of unknowns. Um, we have techno technological unknowns. We have the, the whole issue of uh, European standards and, you know, the fact that all the, a lot of the action is predicated on action, which is completely out with the control of the Scottish Parliament. I'd say we also have the, the issue now of a Trump presidency and uh, a threat potentially to the international framework around climate change and questions about what that may do as well. So again, I'd say that's a laudable aspiration for transport, but uh, given that it's predicated on a few actions which are out with the control of the Scottish Parliament, is that really, uh, can we can be sure that that will deliver and are there not a whole load of other things we could be focusing on in Scotland under the control of Scottish Government, local authorities and so on, which could deliver greater benefits more quickly and it'll actually be more deliverable, more certain than, than, than what's in the plan. Yes. So, I mean, can I just clarify if that's all right? I mean, you said, you know, our reduction over the last, whatever, 16 years, 15 years hasn't been that great. Mm -hmm. And that's really a combination of things. Is that right? Because actually, the, per vehicle, they've become more efficient, but the demand's gone up the other way, and the, and the net combination is, is not it, great. It goes back to the point I was making before about the, the hierarchy of actions. So yes. uh, I think because we haven't focused on reducing demand, we focused on the end of it. Yes, uh -huh. as you say, we have had gains in efficiency, but they've been essentially balanced by growth in traffic. And presumably going forward then, there's going to be again a combination of issues, some going up, some going down. Well, if there's a 27% growth <coughs> in road transport, then that obviously mitigates any improvement gains that are from substitution electric vehicles. I yes. mean, the, the, the lower that growth curve, the more savings you get down the line, uh, obviously, and so on. So, so I think the two are very much related. I'd like to bring in Tom on that, because uh, I'm sure you're going to have some yeah. views there. Uh, the, <coughs> I, I, I agree with what Phil has, has said. I think one important point to remember is that uh, we have a lot of end loading of these emissions savings. So the, the slope of the curve, if you like, or the shape of the curve is not particularly helpful um, because that still means that a lot of carbon is going to be, admit, even if we hit the target by 2030, still a lot of carbon is going to be um, emitted um, in, the, in the earlier years between now and 2030. Um, so the total amount of carbon emitted into the atmosphere is, is greater than if we'd adopted uh, perhaps a more effective measures, or if we adopt more effective measures more quickly. Uh, the second point is, and it relates to, to all the uncertainties here, um, given that there are so many uncertainties, particularly about the policies that are adopted in the CCP, and, and uh, most of those, as Phil was saying, are 
uh, with the direct control of the Scottish Parliament. There are so many risks here of non-achievement. It would be useful if there were, perhaps it is there and I've just missed it, but if it isn't, it would be useful if there is more discussion of what the risks are um, to some of these key policies not being achieved and therefore what, that would, what impact that would have on the targets and what we could do instead and what impact that would have. I mean, I presumably, if, the, if there's a lot of risks in there, it's better to be cautious, is it? Or um, should, can I answer? Uh, uh, well, <laughs> I, I think I think we're we're examining the fact that 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 we we're, we're needing, from what I've heard from Phil and, and from you, Tom, is that it's risk analysis that we need to be right. doing. I think it would be and very then helpful. Targeting yeah. that where we can make a difference, rather than hoping that we can make a difference if it's not too risky. Is is that what you're saying? Uh, yeah. I think, uh, uh, more risk analysis, yeah, effectively, and then that will also drive the choice of, of, of measures, um, because if we think that there's a very high risk that, for example, uh, our leaving the EU is going to have an impact on our uh, use of EU emission standards, then um, we should analyse the risk of that and what we could do instead. Yeah? Um, does it, does any, uh, David, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, uh, just in, in terms of the question about how we're doing and, and perhaps that naturally leads into, into what more we can do or is happening. Um, clearly, I think there's sort of agreement that transport is perhaps the, the underperforming sector when it comes to climate change mitigation and there's far more that can be done. Um, but there have been some improvements since RPP2, um, certainly um, in the space where we work most around um, ultra low emission vehicles. There has been a significant increase in sales. Um, so in 2015, um, sales of electric vehicles were uh, equivalent to the previous four years combined. And 2016, sales look set to outstrip um, those sales numbers as well. Um, so um, things are going quite well. There's also a, a comprehensive network of charging infrastructure to support those. Um, there's more charging points per household in Scotland. Um, uh, than anywhere outside London, apart from North East England and Northern Ireland. So things are going well in that respect as well. I mean, if I could just I'm going to let John come back in to see if with, with, with an additional yeah, just, question. We can bring in some of the other panel members. Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose I'm... I mean, I take the point that we could do with more analysis and more figures and all the rest of it. Um, but somewhere along the line, we've got to come up with a figure and say, well, this is what transport's got to deliver over the next 15 years. Um, so I suppose my question is, you know, if that overall figure... You know, should we be more aggressive and, and, just, and just go for, for a stronger figure, even though there's a lot of risk around it? But because then that would look, make transport look like they're contributing. Yeah. Or do we, are we being, are the government being more cautious and saying, well, really, we're not all that optimistic about transport, therefore that's why we're having a lower limit? Who'd like to come in? David, you yeah, would say. Um, I think the word mm. double-edged sword's already been used today. <laughs> and I think targets can be that. So they, they can be very useful in, in sort of motivating um, investment and um, focusing effort. But they can also create a situation where, um, where you spend your life defending kind of perception that you're not progressing fast enough to hit that target. So setting targets which you know are unachievable um, is probably something that I would caution against. I don't think there's any point in grandstanding and certainly we've seen that happen quite a lot in, in this space. A lot, number of governments have set targets which they've known to be unachievable um, from the outset. Um, I think it also comes down to what you can actually influence as well and, and so many of these things are outside the influence, direct influence mm -hmm. of government that it makes it really, really hard to say, you know, this intervention or the, the, this, this, this measure will lead to this direct outcome. Do you think that's specifically the, more the case in transport, that more things are out with the government's control, whereas, say, in forestry or agriculture, maybe we've, we've got more under our control? Yeah, because it comes down to human behaviour a lot of the time, doesn't it? And, you know, that's where it starts to get very complicated. Yes, that's me. Yes. OK, and uh, Sally, do you want to come in on this target? Just issue? very quickly on the human behaviour point, is that if we concentrate our efforts on reducing, increasing efficiency then there's a, always a countervailing pressure that the cheaper it gets to drive, the less incentive there is not to. So if that's our only tool that we've got, then we, it, it's one that weakens as, as we use it. Whereas if we're using other measures as well, you don't get the same countervailing force, if you like, of it. Basically, if, if, if your electric car costs pennies to run, then why not use it? Um, Stuart, do you want to mentioned something on targets because I'd like to bring in Tom and then I'd like I, to move on. I just to wanted to pick up on that tiny wee point. Isn't the evidence 
that in pricing of travel, that it's the change in the pricing of travel that influences people, not the level of pricing. Uh, and particularly as we've seen uh, oil costs fluctuate, it's at the point of change we see a change in behaviours, but it isn't, doesn't seem to be very much evidence that it's sustained once the price stabilises almost at whatever level it's at. Is that a, a correct or reasonable or incorrect thing to say? In other words, that the solution may not lie simply in the idea that it's pricing. Tom. Um, I think you're talking about the idea of long-term versus short-term elasticities, yes? And um, uh, the long-term and short-term elasticities, i.e. the responsiveness of behaviour to a change in price, uh, they're, very, they're very different. So in the short-term in particular, um, the, the price, say, of, of, of fuel, for people who don't have much choice, is not going to have much influence on uh, how they travel. Um, in the longer term, a big impact of the price of fuel is uh, to influence choice of vehicle, but also to influence the choice of where people live and how they choose to travel. So if we look at North American cities, there's, we were talking about feedback loops earlier, <clears throat> there's clearly a feedback loop between land use and fuel price. In North, in North American cities, they use a huge amount of fuel for transport per capita in comparison with European cities. So I think there we see a bit of a longer term effect feeding into the transport system, longer term effect of fuel price. Oh, a third of ours. Well, yeah, which is a, it's a policy decision because it's yeah. driven by tax. So, um, the, the, I, could I say something about the target question that Mr. Mason raised? Yes, I, yeah. just briefly, if you may. On yeah, the target, just, yeah. just very briefly. Um, should the target be more aggressive? Probably. But I think it would be extremely helpful if there were a range of targets and uh, aligned with each target an explanation of what would have to be done to achieve each target. So it becomes more transparent that if you, if you have a more aggressive target, you have to do more. And then it's easier to, I think, justify the choice of policy measures that, and target that you've finally gone for. Because you can say, well, okay, if we, re if we wanted to achieve a more aggressive target, we would need a more, <coughs> a more complex and interventionist set of measures, and for a variety of reasons to do with yeah. politics, to do with implementability, whatever, we decided that those are not acceptable. Um, I think it would be a, a better way of going about it, that range of targets approach. But perhaps I would say that because I'm you know, an academic and I like that analytical approach. And, and politicians would like that approach because it would give them all a chance to input and say what they want, how they want to achieve it. And, and I'm going to leave the targets there because I think it, that's a very important point. But I'd like to move on to demand management and, and bring in Peter, if I may, on that. Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, demand management, the num well, it, it, we've, we've all heard it's mostly car journeys, so it's, it's journeys by car. We all know that most uh, cars have, have, have only one person in them most of the time. Uh, we just, I just wonder how much could Scottish government get involved in trying to change, which we're speaking of, is trying to change human behaviour, encourage more car sharing schemes, uh, etc., or, or whatever other, other ideas the panel might have uh, in that uh, respect about, you know, lowering the, 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 man, the demand for for journey by car. Tom, yeah. Tom Sorry. Yeah. Yes, Tom. Um, I mean, the demand for car travel is, is basically driven by the cost of car travel and the time that it takes to travel by car compared to other modes. So you, you know, there, are, there are other factors that come in there, but basically it's, it's the cost and the, and the journey time. Uh, and if it's faster and cheaper by car um, and slower and more expensive by other modes or a combination of those two, you'll take the car mostly, particularly if you have free parking or cheap parking close to where you're going. Um, so could, could you manage that? Could you manage that demand for car? Well, if you want to manage that demand for car, you have to influence those factors, essentially. Mm. Uh, if you want to make a big impact on demand for, for car travel, that's what you have to, to get, get at. Um, are there ways that you can, can do that? Yes, modelling that was carried out by the UK DFT in 2004 for a nationwide congestion charging scheme suggested that would have a very significant impact on uh, greenhouse gas emissions from, from transport. Um, mm. But I don't think it's something that's politically acceptable. Car sharing can play a role, but a small role, to be honest, because car sharing mostly 
doesn't have, for, you know, for the majority of users, doesn't have that impact on time or cost. For people who are travelling a long way, who have high petrol costs, um, then yeah, that it will it would something that can help them. But that's sort of at the margins uh, mm -hmm. of demand of demand management. One thing I would also like to draw the, the, the committee's attention to, which hasn't been mentioned yet, is land use, <coughs> um, because the p patterns of land use that we're pursuing in most parts of Scotland at the moment are basically leading to people living further away from where they need to be and further away from each other. And part of the demand for transport is obviously journey distance. And so even if we improve the fuel efficiency and carbon efficiency of our vehicles, if we're living further away and having to travel further, greater distances, that will offset the savings from the fuel efficiency. So mm. that's part of the reason why we haven't really made much impact in the overall uh, CO2 emissions from transport. And I think we should not should not forget land use, and it was slightly disappointing that that's not in the CCP. The final point that I'd like to make about demand management is really about freight and, and van travel, and we have somebody here who's more expert on that than I am, so perhaps I could defer to them if they want to say anything about managing demand in the freight sector. Mm -hmm. But the biggest, some of the biggest growth in traffic has been not in, in uh, personal you know, car travel, but it's been in freight. And we're so we're I think coming we have to, on to freight, okay. so yeah, Tom, uh, I'm right. going to cut that Fine. one if I may at that stage and bring in Sally because I know she wants to, to say something. Well just to reiterate the point that I made that you know um, one can by changing the way we arrange our streets in our cities you can um, make other modes of transport more attractive for mm -hmm. the shorter journeys and that includes um, safe separated infrastructure for cyclists, better design for pedestrians, and just reducing the, the um, permeability of, of towns and cities to the motor vehicle. So um, rather than being able to drive through the centre of town, you drive to the edge and maybe go on by another mode, or you drive around the ring road to get to where you're going rather than trying to filter through maybe a medieval street plan which was never designed for it. And that then starts to change the, 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 you know, if, if you have to drive five miles to get to the other side of town, but you could cycle or walk a mile, then it stops becoming mm -hmm. the obvious, the car stops becoming the obvious choice. Um, and that, you, you know, that works as well for small towns, big cities. It's, it, again, it's looking at the last mile, the last few miles of a journey, even if you're having to do the bulk <coughs> of it by car. Sorry, can, I, can, can I just push you a wee bit on that, if I may, Sally, just so I understand, because it seems to me that, that the more we can keep services within within areas where people are living it, it makes more sense is is that the, the the thrust of what you're saying so shop should be there the, the the post office the bank all the services that people need should be actually within the settlement that they're living in if it's big enough to justify that. well that is yeah that is part of it as well but, um, but also to say that um that you're not encouraging through traffic past okay. these service areas that, so that basically when you the center of town should be for people to stop and do things not to, it should not be a transport route basically mm. okay. can i can i just follow up a wee bit more you, we, we spoke about the 20 mile limit I, I assume sally that you would you would welcome 20 mile limits in the middle of towns because a cyclists will feel safer and uh, traffic will be running about that bit slower and it will help people, encourage people onto, onto the bikes. That would be another yes. uh, driver to, to, to do that. Well, I mean, for me, uh, 20 mile an hour speed limits cut child pedestrian death rates. And as far as I'm concerned, that's argument enough for them. Mm. The, the, the benefit to cyclists is actually slightly marginal. Um, but yes, it does make, again, it, 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 it cuts the... So f just a simple thing, everyone follows their sat-nav now. And if the sat-nav is calculating on speed limits, it will tend to send people around the edges of town rather than through the middle of them. So, you know, it could have an impact on keeping people out of town centres, which would mm. improve things. Mm. Gosh, that would be a nice thought that we could <laughs> meet lorries trying to squeeze through places where they shouldn't be. Does anyone else want to do, talk briefly on demand management? Because we have got quite a lot of questions and I'd like to bring Stuart in with the next one, but anyone want to, to, to push on demand management? Okay, I'll bring Stuart in on the next question for me. Uh, thank you, Kamina. I, re I really want to try and explore what actions can be taken that will actually lead to modal shift. Um, what I've taken from quite a few of the comments, most recently uh, from Sally, that the key thing that will make a difference is to make car transport less attractive to people. Now, politically and policy terms, that's fundamentally difficult. You know, reducing the national speed limit from 60 to 50. 
making people drive further around town so they want to go in other ways, um, etc. In other words, disincentives. Is that how the panel see it? Phil? I, th I, think, I think we have to bite the bullet. But I, I think there are two sides to it. I mean, it, as, as um, Tom and others have alluded to, of course, it's about people make decisions, usually quite logical decisions, based on convenience and cost and so on. So it's about how you change that. So the, 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 the most convenient choices people make are actually the more sustainable and lower carbon choices as well. Um, I, I think Sally's made some points about uh, cycling. Part of it might be speed limit, part of it might be segregated cycleways and just really much greater provision for cycling along the, the lines of many European cities, many of which actually end up with the cities being much more attractive places to live in and, and for people to invest in and so on in terms of the bigger picture. I think workplace parking levies, some other measures like that which impose some costs on on, uh, on the, the road uh, traffic side of things would be important. I think the other thing that we haven't really talked about at all is buses. Now, buses are a major mode of transport, particularly in cities, a more socially inclusive mode of transport. We've seen bus patronage fall by about 10% in the last five years. There's lots, of people, lots that local authorities and Scottish government could do in terms of bus priority measures, uh, uh, inter integrated ticketing, all sorts of other things like that, which would help uh, buses in themselves and also integrate them with other modes, all the sustainable modes, walking and cycling predominantly as well. So I, I think we have to accept that there, there need to be some restrictions on cars, whether it's low emission zones, whether it's uh, workplace parking levies, things like that. We also need to look at how we make the other modes more attractive so that cycling actually becomes a pleasurable thing, not a rather scary thing you can do I, on the road with, with all sorts I, of other Can I just stuff. come in? Yes. I'm hearing a lot of the positive changes we can make to make alternatives more attractive. But isn't it the, really in practice that while that is necessary mm -hmm. to get people out of their cars, it won't make a whit of difference if people are satisfied with the car as their mode of transport? Well, I think, I mean, if you look at Edinburgh, where they, they have spent more in cycling provision than other Scottish cities, we are seeing some increase in cycle uh, use compared to, to other cities. So I think the, the enhancement of that is right. But it has to be an integrated package. It has to be at thinking, as Sally was saying before, how you create a situation where, where the cycle route is the shorter, safer, more attractive route, the car route and the parking provision and everything else is more expensive, it takes longer to travel by car and so on, combined with faster bus services, et cetera, other, other alternatives, trams, et cetera, urban rail that's actually useful and so on as well. So I, 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 I agree that a lot of people are wedded to cars and maybe it needs some bold action, but I think we can see elsewhere in Europe how that integrated package of bold action has actually delivered uh, much higher uptake of cycling, so, much higher uptake Stuart, of pedestrians. Dis disincentive and incentive. It, it's it's a balanced package, yeah. So, Stuart, sorry, I want to bring in David. Who is yeah, um, I almost feel like I should apologise for sounding pro-car, and I'm not. I'm actually pro-climate, and I think we kind of get trapped in, in being anti-car as being a solution to some of this. Um, I think we need to be realistic about the fact that 100% increase in the number of kilometres cycled in Scotland would only be the equivalent of about 1% of all cars in Scotland being ultra low emission vehicles. So in terms of contribution to climate change ambitions, I think we need to be absolutely realistic about that. I think we also need to attribute the fact that um, when you're looking at CO2 emissions, you're looking at sort of 79% of those emissions being journeys that are greater than five kilometres, so typically wouldn't be cycled. I think about 60% of them are, are greater than uh, 10 kilometres, so typically wouldn't be taken by public transport and buses. Um, I think when it comes to buses, we also need to recognise that actually buses are a major source of air quality issues in many cities as well. So again, it's not a, it's not a simple, straightforward answer that modal shift is a solution to, to climate change or air quality improvements. Yeah. Clearly need to make progress across decarbonising all forms of, of, of transport and, and encouraging more active and sustainable transport as well. I um, absolutely agree with you about um, radical measures and things like low emission zones will bring about radical changes in behaviours. There is a lot of enthusiasm around things like workplace parking levies. And so they are, they are the sticks that can be used to encourage or to make transformative, to tra I transformation happen. I think the committee would, would take that, that, that bicycling is, isn't going to be the, the saving grace as far as emission concerns, but there is a huge health implication, which the, oh, the committee is also minded for, that, that, that bicycling will, will improve health. And on that, I see Sally about to, I hope not to disagree with me, but Sally. Uh, what I was going to say is that cycling also unlocks other forms of transport. 
So to get to Edinburgh today from rural Dumfries, I cycled, took a bus and a train um, rather than drive to the station. So uh, a, a short journey by bike makes a bus, a rural bus more effective. Um, and I think you have to remember that at places like Glasgow, 50% of households have no access to a car. So, you know, we're not punishing in, in, in many ways by effectively we subsidize the car in ways that we don't really notice by things like free parking and so that we're actually imposing costs on the people who have no choice um, and we're also obliging people to use cars who maybe don't want to use them and you know most children would rather walk or cycle to school um, but because of the issues around danger and, and distance and so on are, are not able to do that so I think I know it's difficult for politicians to say that feel that they're attacking cars, but actually what you're actually doing is rebalancing things and giving people the choice and also giving the people who don't have access to a car, you know, some of the benefits that, that the car driver up to now has had. Okay, I'm just going to move this on, if I may, to, to low emission vehicles, because I think this is quite critical. Um, sorry, Rhoda. You... Okay, briefly, if I, yeah. yeah, yeah bit, sorry. Briefly. I mean, some of the issues that on... Sorry. Um, buses to improvement of buses has, have been answered. But I was interested in one comment about cycling and bus use. Um, buses, you know, we know that they have little space for wheelchairs, pushchairs. How do you get that to work properly? Should every bus stop have a cycle rack where people can leave their cycles or their, their bikes or is there... Um, got, do buses have to be fitted with some way of people taking their bicycles on the bus? Sally? Well, certainly in the Netherlands, you would see bike parking at every bus stop, and some of the bus interchanges will have more bike parking than you see at a UK train station. Um, so that's one way of doing it. Um, other places, bikes can be carried on buses, either on racks outside. I think most rural buses are very empty, and with a little bit of flexibility, you could probably get one or two bikes into a bus um, especially, you know, as long as they give way to wheelchairs and pushchairs. I mean, there, there, are, there are ways and means, but yes, we do need to do a lot more. Bus and bike and bus is difficult. I, I have invested in a folding bike to enable myself to do that kind of journey. I couldn't do it otherwise. So. Okay. And can I also ask about um, bus passes? We're going to have a consultation on um, bus pass eligibility. Um, and the suspicion is that the eligibility will increase from 60 to an older age. What impact will that have on, on carbon and people's use of buses? Mm -hmm. Phil, do you want to come in on that? I, I wasn't wanting to come in on that. I just wanted to come in. I, I don't really have an answer to that. I mean, I, 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 um, I, I, I think that there may be research out there, but I don't know about that. I mean, just on the, on the use of bike, the interchange, I mean, I think it's about creating a system of seamless interchange. Part of it's about information provision as well, you know, using... Uh, phones, etc., so that people can know when buses are coming, make that a seamless journey. I think there's a real issue with bikes on trains, in, particularly in rural Scotland as well, in terms of very limited capacity. And the fact you have to book sometimes weeks in advance to get a bike and a train and so on. And I think that's something that, the, that, that needs to be looked at for railways as well as for buses. But as Sally said, all, all, the, all the things we see elsewhere in Europe, which shows, shows they can be done, uh, in terms of uh, uh, decent bus provision, at, uh, decent bike provision at bus stops and at railway stations, I think it's absolutely essential. Tom, you wanted to come in. Yeah, um, some some research that we did at Edinburgh Napier, um, when the national minimum entitlement of a free fare was introduced, um, we we found, and this has been corroborated by other research, that the wealthier car owning elderly um, were to some extent leaving their car at home, particularly for trips into town, because they had more time and thought it was a bit of a bargain to go on a bus for nothing. So uh, one would suppose that if that is taken away from some of them, then they'll revert back to using their car for those types of trips. But they'd be relatively short trips. Therefore, you know, in terms of the overall sum of the carbon impact, it wouldn't be enormous, would it? but it wouldn't be a positive impact. It would be working away from the targets. I think is, uh, be... yes, sir. Does anyone else want to come in? Because I'd quite like to move on to this, uh, the low emission side of it, if I may. Uh, Murray. Convener, um, it was just really to ask you all whether you think that the, what the Scottish Government, the estimated uptake of ultra low emission vehicles, if you think that the predictions, the estimates of that are realistic and achievable, and that's for both private and for freight as well. So who'd like to, to start on that? 
David, do you want to? Um, it's our best guess, I think, is a good way of looking at it. So it, it reflects a lot of forecasts that have been made um, at the current time. Um, and that's, as I mentioned earlier, that's kind of an evolving um, understanding of, of how quickly markets will progress. Um, and there's two ways of looking at it as well. There's, there's one is, you know, what's, what's the industry intelligence telling us in terms of um, the rate of diffusion of these vehicles into the market? How quickly do we expect people to buy them? How quickly do we expect technology to advance to get to a price point and a level of functionality that will appeal to private and um, commercial <coughs> um, fleets? Um, and the other is, what do we need to achieve for kind of emissions reduction in targets and air quality improvements? And, and you know, they're not exactly the same answer, unfortunately. Um, and and that's, a, that's a real challenge. But um, I think from my understanding of uh, other outlooks, um, it is ambitious. Um, and sitting alongside you know, the climate change plan can't be taken in isolation. You know, Transport Scotland's um, switched on Scotland electric vehicle roadmap has ambitions which are highly ambitious, perhaps go even further than the, the, the climate change plan in terms of uh, the 2050, 2040 and 2030 ambitions that it sets. So I, I do think that there is sufficient level of ambition in Scotland on this agenda. Um, but ambition is one thing, action is, is, is separate. So I, th I think we still need a joined up plan to make everything happen. We, we've talked quite a lot about uh, private use. Uh, I wondered if, because one part of Murray's question was on freight, I wondered if we could develop a bit. Does anyone have any views on the freight and how to do that? Jason? Yes, I'm the freight and logistics specialist that Tom was referring to earlier, hence some of my lack of answers to some of, uh, or lack of jumping in on some of the other questions. Um, I don't know if we're going to talk later. There's a lot of mention of consolidation centres in here. I don't know if you have a specific question on that, but that's um, certainly part of it. So I'll, I won't get into that too much detail now if you want to talk about that in a separate question, but that's certainly related to uh, the use of electric vehicles. I mean, we've seen in the, in the statistics, actually a lot of the growth in freight vehicles is in, is in um, actual LGVs, it's in the, the white vans. Um, so that's happening now anyway, but certainly if you're looking at more use of consolidation centres, uh, having the, you know, the HGVs coming to the consolidation centre and then uh, distributing from there in, um, in vans, um, there's obviously the potential there for a lot of them to be electric. Also things like cargo bikes as well, uh, other, other sort of forms of, of, of that kind of level of delivery, depending on how far it is and the distance and so on. So there's a bit of an issue with, it's very important with LGVs growing already and potentially growing more if we go for a more consolidation centre approach. Uh, it is very important that a lot of them be electric because that's actually going to potentially have more, more numbers of vehicles on the street, maybe smaller vehicles, but load larger numbers. Um, and potentially they're not, and they're not always full. So that could actually have a counterintuitive uh, result of having a lot more vehicles in the city streets. So, um, so that's an issue from congestion it's, point of view, et cetera, anyway, but certainly in terms of emissions, um, you want them to be, many of them to be low em emission as possible. There's been a lot of research on, on electric, use of electric vans um, and cargo bikes and other things like that um, uh, in other countries. And it certainly seems achievable that, that you can get that level of take up. But again, there's so many unknowns, as we know. It's very hard to predict whether it will happen or not, happen or not, because so much of it is, it's just behavior. But mm -hmm. I think it's, yeah, I think it's reasonable. All right, do you want to come back? Uh, yeah, yeah, well, it's just it was really interesting this week because there'd been an article issued and it was uh, in relation to what's happening in Norway and the uptake of electric vehicles there, which uh, seems to be the, the leader amongst a lot of countries in terms of what's happening. And I think it was something like about nearly 40% of newly registered cars there are electric vehicles. And it was really just to, to ask you a bit about the incentives that are offered there. I mean, what is it that's, that's happening there that we could be doing here, that we should be doing here? Um, and I think even just from direct experience of having a family member even trying to purchase an electric car, it just seems that here, I mean, it's, it's so complex and that's not fully explained to you when, when even you go into purchase, uh, purchase these things in terms of the slow, rapid, fast charge, uh, how these points are split up across the country. And sometimes it feels a bit like pots of money are made available to install electric charging points without an overall strategic picture of how that, that fits in. So I'd be just be interested to get your thoughts on that. Mm -hmm. Um, Tom? Yeah, um, sort of anticipating that there might be some discussion in Norway, I had a bit of a look at some of the literature on what's, what's happened there. Mm -hmm. And maybe David knows more than this, because it's not my area of expertise, but I thought it was a good idea to swat up on it. Um, and as far as I understand, the Norwegian purchase incentive package consists of zero purchase tax, which knocks off 11, about 10,000 quid, 
Plus, they, they don't have to pay VAT on an electric vehicle. Um, they get reduced road tax, free public parking. They don't have to pay tolls, which are quite... Uh, there's quite a lot of toll systems in, Norway's, in Norway. They get free charging at public charging points as well. Um, but strangely, there was no, until very recently, no, recently no national strategy on, um, on charging infrastructure. So that was all a bit ad hoc in Norway. But now there is, there is um, uh, a strategy. Oh, and they get free access to bus lanes as well. Um, so all that together reduces the cost premium of an electric vehicle to about 1,000 euros, well, 900 quid. Um, so, David, does that sound about right to you? But yeah. I, was just, I was then just going to compare that to um, what the, what's in the report, in the CCP report, in terms of the level of incentive that we were talking about and the cost differential. But I'm how would you, happy to sorry. bring David in. Sally was a bit nervous, I think, when you were going through the list of things that um, electric cars got, that they might be going into cycle lanes as well. But, but, bus lanes, but, uh, which, unfortunately, are, are considered to be cycling infrastructure in this country. But... Um, uh, only the only point I really want to make on this is that the one it seems like the one electric vehicle that does not seem to be subsidized in the carbon plan here is is the electric bike which is now forming something like a third of the market in places like the Netherlands and Germany and is starting to transform the five to ten mile journey as well as the naught to five mile journey so again you know we we talk about the bike as though it can only do very short journeys but um, it, actually it becomes much more capable with a with pedal heck um, on top of it. David, before I bring you in, can I just ask Jamie just to, because I think linked to this is how to encourage, you've got a specific question now. Come, uh, well, if you'd like to, yeah, Murray, if you'd like to come. Well, it, it's also, sorry, just to tease out as well and ask a bit more about if any of you have an idea of how the Aberdeen hydrogen bus project has been going as well. So I think that's been obviously a, an initiative here and just to hear your thoughts about that, if you know how that's been operating and about hydrogen infrastructure too. You'd like to lead on that. Tom, <laughs> looks like you're, you're constantly in the firing line. I'm, I mean, well, keen, keen sorry, to bring I others in. I don't but know you... anything about it, really. I mean, I've heard of it, obviously, but I, I've not, I really don't know how, how it's going. I mean, all I can say is that f hydrogen fuel, set, fuel, set not, fuel, cell, fuel cell technology is still relatively experimental, and the big, big challenge is, of course, providing the fuel, as it's very energy intensive to provide, to make the fuel, and then actually the fuel, fueling infrastructure is, is a little bit problematic. Um, can David. We, we, no. we, we have had some involvement with the Aberdeen okay. project, yeah. so we can say a little bit um, yeah. uh, quite recently. So it's, it's gone well. Um, it's been great for the city. Um, it certainly has, um, the city's received a lot of global interest and attention from that. It fits really well with the, the skills and capabilities in, in the city and obviously with uh, the focus on oil and gas and, and associated processing industries, a great amount of expertise in handling hydrogen and a great amount of hydrogen produced. Uh, the buses are, uh, are working well. Um, so I think there's a, a really strong economic argument for it, I think, um, in terms of, of what it could mean for the city. In terms of hydrogen as a, uh, a, 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 um, uh, a solution to decarbonising transport, I think there's still some way to go at the moment. And I, I think this comes down to really understanding that it's going to be a mix of solutions that bring about this kind of low carbon future for transport. So hydrogen will have a role, electric vehicles will have a role, cycling, public transport will have a role. And it, I think it's quite easy to... Um, get trapped by thinking about sort of uh, binary thinking about one form of transport or one, one type of fuel over another and really it's going to be like renewables we'll see a mix of mm -hmm. solutions in the future hydrogen is expensive though um, and I think um, anecdotal observations have been that you know the, the, the price of the hydrogen fuel is actually <coughs> higher than diesel and there is some necessar necessity to subsidise that at the moment but you know again technology will progress the distribution systems will advance and you know things will get cheaper and easier so Hydrogen is not a short-term solution, is perhaps the, the short answer to that. I want to bring in uh, Peter and Stuart, and I see Tom's wanting to come in. So, Peter, if, it, if this is a supplementary to that, please. Yeah, well, it's back to my question that you ruled out of order the last time. Uh, yeah. I, I want to ask about the, the future of the battery technology, just basically what I said last time round. If it's adopted worldwide, is there, is there the mineral resource within this planet to, to, to build all these batteries? David? Um, it's, 
It's not something we can take for granted, but mm. it's um, certainly electric vehicles will not be the source of that problem. So consumer electronics like laptops, mobile phones, and things like that, it's essentially the same battery technology, lithium-ion batteries, um, and um, those consumer devices will account for a, a larger proportion of the global demand for those resources than, than, than transport. Um, there are, you know, lots of um, efforts around things like rare earth elements, which are components of, of battery technologies, and, and also recognising that some of these elements come from um, parts of the world where, you know, there are some security and stability issues occasionally. So it is a, um, an issue that is being um, given some attention by, by governments around the world, but it's not something that will necessarily hold back progress in, in mm. that sector. Okay. Tom, do you want to come in? It wasn't about battery technology, it was just finishing off what I had to say about Norway and its implications for the projections in, this, in the climate change plan. Very briefly then. Very briefly. Okay, so the cost differential in Norway between an electric car and a standard car is reduced to about a thousand euros. The, um, the pr predictions or the, the, the modelling in the climate change plan assumes a cost difference between a a uh, diesel car and a battery electric vehicle of five and a half thousand pounds in 2030. So a much bigger price differential is assumed in the climate change plan than we see in Norway at the moment. And in Norway, the, my info suggests a 27% market share for plug-in hybrids and, and battery electric vehicles in total. So, um, yeah, I, I wonder whether the range of incentives that's modelled in the climate change plan for take-up of uh, these low-emission vehicles is sufficient uh, to achieve the level of market penetration that is assumed to bring about the carbon reductions that, that are in the plan, um, which is why it goes back to my plea for a range of projections <laughs> rather than just one. Yeah. Stuart wants to come in briefly, and then I'd like to move, move on to Jamie, if I may. Um, just to be observation, rare earths are not rare. They're just called rare because when they were found, they were difficult to find and extract. They're not common, but they're not rare. That wasn't my point. Um, <laughs> the, the, uh, I, I learned something the, at every committee meeting, Stuart. <laughs> the, it, 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 it's really the, the history of government's interaction with new emerging technologies is a history of almost total failure to predict what's going to be the winners. We just know that. They're all governments of all complexions in all countries, that's true. And on hydrogen in particular, I'm aware of four separate hydrogen technologies. It's not just cells. And I'm just worried, and I want to see if the worries share, that we're putting too much emphasis on single solutions rather than a strategic goal. I mean, for example, one of the hydrogen technologies I'm aware of is a suspension of hydrogen in a sort of gel that creates a fuel that you can actually put into existing diesel vehicles. It's in the lab, may never emerge from the lab, who knows? Um, but I, just the general point, are we getting too fixated about the technologies rather than the goal? And we should, be, should we be much more careful to leave the door open to disruptive technologies that might be discovered next week and prove to be viable in 10 years' time? That's, the real question. I'm, I'm very happy to let everyone in, and, 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 and I think this is uh, a, a question that, that you can answer hopefully very briefly, so I will push you on brevity because I w there are other questions here, and I want to get Jason back in on the freight, if I may. David. Um, no, I agree. I, I think the, the stated position of um, the Scottish Government is, is technology neutral, and I think that's the, the right approach. I do think there's a huge amount of hype around hydrogen, though, um, yeah. and it's, 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 it's easy to get excited about a technology that's not yet there. Um, and I think ultimately the market will decide, and perhaps the role of government is to um, support the market when it's pre-commercial, uh, when it seems to be um, a technology that will deliver significant benefits. Um, so, yeah, I would advocate a um, technology-neutral approach. However, I think that also needs to be aware that the way that that message is communicated to markets can be confusing. So mm. a lot of the um, technology neutrality commentary from government almost suggests that there's a suspicion that maybe electric vehicles are a, a stepping stone towards a hydrogen future, which is, you know, none of the outlooks would suggest that. So I think you need to be careful that that, that isn't communicated in a way where it implies any uncertainty about the future. It certainly... You know, there is there's consensus that electric vehicles, for example, are going to be the dominant uh, propulsion technology in the future, and that, but that future will contain a range of different alternative fuels. 
Uh, Tom, I'm not going to bring you in there. What I'd like to do is just leave that one hanging at the moment and bring Jamie in, if I may, just about in in encouragements. Uh, thank you, Convener. Um, I think uh, I'm sort of varying slightly from what's on our papers here, but I just thought I would add to the, this conversation about hydrogen technology. I, I was reading an interesting article yesterday where it was described as the Betamax of car technology in the sense that there's a lot of hype around it, as, as you said, but, it, uh, um, and it, but the take-up was very low. There was a UK government scheme, I think, last year uh, to local authorities and public bodies to uh, replace uh, vehicles, and there was funding available around £2 million, I think, and it's been taken up by very few public bodies. I think London Met, for example, have replaced some of their vehicles, but um, it's just an observation, really, on, on that subject. But um, I wondered if I could come on to the wider question about the move to these types of vehicles. Um, I, I've just been reading your uh, inputs um, in our briefing papers, and I was quite intrigued by a few comments. I wondered if you could expand on them. Sally, I think in your uh, input, you say that incentives to increase take-up of fuel-efficient vehicles will increase car ownership and undermine the demand management policy. I was wondering if you might just expand on your views on, on these sort of schemes or, or, you know, there seems to be a view that perhaps we shouldn't be incentivising people to move to these types of cars. Well, I think we just need to be careful about the incentives we offer. Um, so, uh, I think, uh, for instance, if one of the few demands, one of the few demand management policies that's in there is parking controls, and if, if by buying an electric vehicle you can then circumvent the parking controls, um, that you know, has, is, is an example of the two policies working against each other. Um, and uh, parking, obviously, as well as being... Um, lots of on-street parking causes problems for other means of transport because, you know, once you have cars lining the edges of the roads, that makes it difficult for buses, it makes it difficult for pedestrians and so on. So we need to be a bit careful about the incentives that we offer um, mm -hmm. to make sure that um, we're not, you know, taking with one hand and giving with the other. I, I, I hear what you're saying on that. Um, I think that comes on to the point that Tom made, and that's uh, the, you know, the Norway model. And, and I'd say as a, as a diesel car driver, uh, if somebody came along and offered me an electric car, which meant I could use bus lanes and park for free in the city centre, absolutely I would swap the diesel car out for a greener electric car if, if those incentives were available. So I think we have to be mindful of the, the fact that these incentives do get people off of uh, you know, um, high emission vehicles and into, uh, to, you know, when, when the Prius came out, for example, there was a lot of suspicion around uh, the success of it, um, but now every cab that I get into seems to be a hybrid car, and it seems to be de facto, you know, normal and, and acceptable to do, to do, so I wonder if anyone had any views on that. Tom wants to come in on that. It was specifically on the Norway experience. Uh, early research, 2009 research in Norway, um, demonstrates exactly what you were talking about there, that uh, the people who uh, have taken up and have bought an electric car. They're, uh, they're disproportionately two car out owning households, which is unusual in Norway. Most households own one car. And their, their rate of commuting uh, is 80% by car compared to 45% by uh, amongst the population as a whole. And the people who bought a car, an electric car, demonstrated a shift away from public transport cycling and walking to electric car, presumably because some of these, um, you know, the demand management tools that apply to people who don't have an electric car no longer apply to them, particularly the parking. Uh, so I think we have to be you know, cautious, as you, as you suggest. Uh, yeah. David, do you want to come in on that? Um, so I, I've visited Norway a few times, and um, they, have a, they have a great package of measures, but fundamentally electric cars are cheaper in Norway than um, fossil fuel vehicles, so it, it's, it's a very easy decision for a Norwegian to make. You know, the upfront cost is, is um, marginal in terms of um, the premium and operating costs are far lower. So, you know, it's, it's a very rational decision in many ways. Um, I don't think we're going to be in a situation anytime soon where there's a 100% purchase tax on top of the uh, cost of buying uh, a, a fossil fuel vehicle. I, I think that would be very difficult to introduce. They also started about 10 years earlier than, than we did. So, again, they're sort of 10 years further forward. We do have things like in the city of Dundee, you can park for anywhere for free today with an electric vehicle. Um, uh, you know, the, the Scottish approach is very joined up. There is a, um, not only is the Switch on Scotland roadmap covering all of the incentives necessary to um, bring about widespread adoption of electric vehicles, but there's also um, 
uh, national framework for local incentives. That's a, a review paper that we wrote for Transport Scotland, looking at what local authorities can do. Um, there's also the integrated energy strategy, which I think merits notes that you know this joined up approach to a strategy that covers power, heat, and transport, looking at it in the mix. And the uh, Switched on Scotland roadmap is currently being updated by Transport Scotland as well, and will be um, published in spring of this year. So there's an opportunity to feed into that process. So uh, does anyone have a view on the target of 40% by 2030? Uh, some of the inputs into the committee were that that isn't aggressive enough. It should be up, up to near 60%, for example. And that's the new cars, obviously. Um, do you have a view on that? Yeah, so the 2050 ambition is um, uh, almost complete decarbonisation of road transport. Um, so if you work backwards from 2050, what you need to achieve to hit to that point, you need to... Um, you probably need to get to a point where almost all new car sales are ultra low emission vehicles by 2040, which would be further ahead than the 40%. So, um, yeah, uh, the 2050 target's ambition, sorry, still stands, um, and the UK government has signed up to that as a, as a target as well. So, um, whether they are um, consistent in, the, in their ambition or not is perhaps worth questioning. Thank you. Um, just before we move on to the, the next question, which is read, I'd just like to just develop, I don't think we've, we've developed enough on freight, um, and I have this concern that, that and, I, and I thought Jason's point was very interesting about hubs and, and, and pushing out from hubs using electric uh, uh, fans would, would reduce the, the uh, emissions. I wonder, Jason, if you'd just like to just briefly... Uh, if, if you would, just explain to the committee some of your plans or suggestions for, for increasing the use of freight on, on other means apart from roads and reducing emissions. Sure. Yes, poor old freight is often the, the sort of forgotten cousin, I'm afraid, in, in terms of transport. Um, well, the one thing I wanted to point out, really, is there was a lot of mention of consolidation centres in this document. I mean, several times mentioned, sometimes on its own, sometimes in conjunction with the low emission zones. Um, and this is something, you know, the last 10 years of transport policy and other documents have mentioned consolidation centres, but, well, I mean, we still don't have one in Scotland. So, I mean, to say that, that private sector operators and users are reluctant to use consolidation centres is a massive understatement. Basically, they have no interest at all because they potentially add costs because you have extra handling and things, potentially add time, add complications because you've got to do it, have extra storage and, um, you know, you're kind of putting an extra link in the chain. So it causes a lot of, lot of difficulty and hassle and cost that they, they don't want. So there's been a lot of talk about how can we get them, how can we make them more feasible? Can we make them cheaper? Can we make them more attractive, et cetera, et cetera? And there's been a lot of work done by a lot of people, but we still haven't got there. Um, in fact, uh, Tectran had actually got quite close. I've done a lot of work on this, and they had one almost that was going to run... Um, and then it didn't run, but it looks like they might get one off the ground eventually in, uh, in Perth, I think. So it takes a lot, of, a lot of work from the public sector to really try and get that, that model together. So, um, so this is something we're doing a bit of work on, actually, at, at Napier. We've recruited a PhD student to look into this. Um, so she's looking at some comparisons with other countries where they've been a bit more successful, but more specifically to look at the conjunction of the consolidation centre and a supportive policy. So... Some of the mentions here, I think, are good that if you have a low emission zone or, or other things like time windows or pedestrianisation, um, can that then, if the consolidation centre doesn't work now, will it work if you have the policy? So, I mean, it'll be another year or so till we get some results on that. But I think that is the way it has to go. You need definitely a supportive policy. Um, also, it's important to think about um, different kinds of consolidation centres. So you might have one on the edge of town, like on the bypass kind of, which would be much larger, or you could have one kind of reasonably in town, like sort of Cameron Toll or in Fountain Bridge, somewhere that sort of level, which would be a smaller one. And then you can have smaller, again, sometimes people call them micro-consolidation centres, like, say, in Rose Street or something, a really small one, and you'd probably deliver from there even on trolleys or, or bikes or things like that. So you, you kind of, depending on which type of, of sort of hub you're talking about, they've all got their own strengths and weaknesses and traffic profiles and, and things like that. But... We haven't really cracked that nut yet. And even, even in other countries, there's few that are really successful. They, even in other countries that are potentially a bit more progressive in their transport policy than we are, still a difficult nut to crack. Um, one thing we're also looking into um, is pedestrianisation, actually, which isn't, it's not really considered, you wouldn't think of it as a freight policy, really, but 
um, if you pedestrianise the city centre and you then you obviously it's difficult to, to deliver to those shops and hotels and things. So it kind of becomes a, a potentially supportive freight transport policy to work with a consolidation centre. So yeah, I think there's a lot of work to be done, but I think this, this um, complementary approach is is the is the right way to go. But yeah, still a lot of work to be done on on that topic. I would say. Okay, thank you, Tom. You want to come in on that? I mean, um, with the consolidation centre idea is very interesting for dealing with the problems of urban freight deliveries and all associated problems like large trucks in urban areas that shouldn't shouldn't be there, that type of thing. But um, they deal with the last mile or the last few miles of a freight journey. And from a carbon perspective, of course, as with passenger transport, the bulk of emissions are coming from longer journeys or the longer sections of journeys. Therefore, the consolidation centre's effect on carbon emissions might not be so great, although I don't think it's been particularly well assessed as yet. We have to think also about what measures there might be to influence carbon emissions from uh, trucks and especially vans because the biggest growth in this sector has really been amongst vans you know that aren't going to city centres that wouldn't be affected by um, by consolidation centres and I think a lot of those to do with fuel technology uptake of alternative fuels uptake of um, electric vans and these these types of measures and also fuel efficiency measures for HGVs some of those are being driven already by uh, the the sector anyway for because larger companies want to achieve fuel savings but I think there's a lot more that government could potentially do to uh, encourage uptake of those new technologies to reduce the carbon emissions per mile from the vehicles that are, tra that are out there traveling. Jason I'm going to let you come back and then I'm going to move to Rodra if I may. I just wanted to add a little on, expand on Tom's point about the longer distance uh, in freight in, uh, in my case. Um, a lot of that is, is some of it's really been achieved by modal shift so there's been a lot in terms of between England and Scotland, there's been a, a large increase um, in modal shift to, from road on, onto rail, and that's been driven a lot by the logistics providers that they'll consolidate containers from different uh, different shippers and, and then fill the train. Um, but a lot of they they all rely on ongoing subsidies, the modal shift revenue support scheme. So it's it's been a wor very worthwhile achievement, but it's costing you know a lot of money annually to to support all that. Uh, looking specifically within Scotland. The, the difficulties with longer distance freight, obviously Scotland's quite rural, quite dispersed, S same for passenger and freight. Um, it's harder for passengers to get on the, it's harder to support rural bus networks and likewise it's harder to support, to get freight onto to the rail network because there's only a few major spines uh, and the freight's quite dispersed. And there's been some success on that again with the logistics companies taking some stuff up to Aberdeen and Inverness, um, subject to infrastructure constraints. And there is a mention somewhere here talks about the rail freight strategy and about needing to get longer trains and that's something that, that is very important because I mean it talks about electrification as well which is also valuable to get more of the rail network electrified but if you can only take 20 containers on a train well, if you can then change that so you can take 40 it's costing you very little more and you're getting twice as many trucks off the road so I know network rail are doing a lot of work ongoing on that to make longer passing loops and all these kind of uh, basically more capacity so you can get longer trains but I mean, in the United States, for instance, they have trains that can take 600 containers, um, and in the UK, the longest trains are about 90. And, and in some of rural, you know, to get to, to the north of Scotland, you're talking 30, 40 kind of things. So that kind of gives you a sense of the scale of what we're trying to achieve. So definitely things like that to get longer trains will help. But freight is quite dispersed. Things like timber, there's been a lot of work to try and get more timber on rail, but as you can imagine, it's very dispersed again. So these are sort of ongoing challenges that that recur in every one of these documents, unfortunately, but again, um, a resolution appears on yeah, the horizon. I'll quickly bring in John Finney before, I, I did say I was going to move on to, to Red, but I, John, uh, Thank you. Yeah, it, was, it was just to pick up on that phrase you used there in relation to, and oh, would, it would be great if 30 or 40 containers could go to on the Highland main line, but there is, infra you, you said uh, subject to infrastructure restraints there. Um, it is back to the issue of looking at a policy in splendid isolation because the infrastructure seems to mean that it's only 20 or 21 mm. units, which isn't the optimum number, obviously, because of single line. Yep. I'm, I'm, I suppose I'm going to ask you if there's, a, if there's an answer to, to, <laughs> to trying to marry all these issues together because people um, are trying very hard when you talk about the combination of, of freight and that's happening, you know, the supermarket goods going up, timber com, um, coming down. Um, 
where does that fit in? Or, or is, is there a gap in explaining how the benefits could be accrued in the plan? Um, well, it's, I mean, it's like a lot of these problems we're discussing today, there's, there's several, several different inputs. There's demand from getting the customers to want to use rail in the first place, which took a long time, but that's, they're starting to get used to it now. Um, there's the cost. I mean, they, these also get subsidised because until you can get much longer trains, you need that, that, that's what you need to bring the unit cost down. Um, so they end up being subsidised. There's th sort of delays. I mean, if you only have one train a day or maybe not even that many, that doesn't fit into all the shops, uh, you know, just-in-time logistics and all this kind of thing. So, you know, there's se several different reasons why... I mean, basically, if you look anywhere around the world where freight is very successful and cheap, um, you've got high capacity, high frequency, high demand, you know, balanced demand in both directions. So, the, I mean, the government can't really click their fingers and, and fix all of these. A lot of things are our market things. What some things they can do is the infrastructure, and, and Network Rail are doing a very good job of that. But, again, it comes down to sort of cost-benefit. How many tens of millions do they want to spend to get 10 more, contra 10 more containers a day Going, going to Aberdeen, when they crunch the numbers, that might not stack up at the end of the day, unfortunately. John, uh, just a, a, a very brief... Y yes, but, but, but similarly, if you spend three billion dueling the A9, sure. giving and give a further yeah. half-hour competitive advantage to haulage by increasing the speed limit, you're not going to get that move. Yeah, I mean, certainly the rail freight group uh, have had a lot to say on that, yeah, so they can... I, I fear that was a statement, and, and maybe we should leave that hanging there so I can get Rhoda in with her question, if I may. Um, thank you. Um, can I ask about um, decarbonising uh, rail and ferry, things like rail electrification and hybrid ferries? The good value for money, do they make a difference? I mean, I'm not really uh, the ferry expert. I think our, our erstwhile colleague, Professor Alf Baird, would be the man to talk much more about ferry design and things like that. Um, in terms of electrifying rail freight, again, is it worth doing on long rural routes? I mean, that, that is a thorny one. You want to do it as, as much as possible, of course, but if you've only got a, a train a day, um, in, on the freight terms, obviously you've got more passenger trains. Again, to refer back to the United States, I mean, I've talked to, to, to operators over there and they think you're crazy to, you're not gonna electrify thousands of miles. Um, so the longer the distance, the less, less co cost benefit really of, of electrification. So they're looking at obviously more within, within England and, um, and within the central belt. Um, I mean, I don't know the figures off the top of my head, but I think electrifying long distance rural routes compared to just using maybe lower emission fuel might be uh, potentially more, of an, uh, more beneficial. I mean, you mentioned, uh, in, well, cold, cold ironing is mentioned in here, but it's using shore power in, in ports. So when the, ship is, when the ship is berthed there, instead of using their own onboard engine to, to power the lights and everything, you can plug into to an electric connection on, in the port. But again, so if you're a big port, you have many ships, um, that the cost benefit, we, you know, you'll, you'll spread that cost over much more, over many more vessels. But a lot of smaller ports in Scotland, they don't have so many vessels. Do you, how many millions are you going to spend for electrification of the shore power, or of the, of the power in the vessel, whereas you might get more bang for your buck uh, using just lower emission fuel and, uh, and other technologies. It's, it's not really for me to say, but it's an, the individual making that decision might have questions about the cost benefit. Phil wants to come in, and then <clears throat> I'm very mindful that I've got three committee members who've got three very important questions who, who want to ask them. So if I can let Phil come in very briefly and then move on. Uh, to the next question, if I may. Yes, yeah, just, I mean, in terms of rail, rail electrification, I mean, rail has a very low contribution to the overall carbon footprint already. You know, it's a very efficient form of, of transport. Electrification is good for all sorts of reasons, increased acceleration, journey, better journey times, and so on as well. Um, I think going back to the point Mr Finney and others have made, look at the big corridors we have, particularly Aberdeen Inverness, uh, Perth Inverness. We've got a Victorian single-track railway not suitable either for fast journey times for passengers or for freight at the moment. And no passing loops or very few passing loops and this sort of thing. Um, and rather than thinking about these corridors in total and look at the road and the rail together, we've gone for throwing billions of pounds at road and not really thinking about a railway which is already slower, as, as uh, one of my colleagues has said, than, than the, the rail alternative. So electrification, particularly, uh, I would say, up to the Aberdeen, uh, on the Aberdeen line and some upgrade there is really important. 
in terms of the Highland lines, it's about dueling the track as much as possible. Uh, and that's, that's great for passengers and for rail. And I think those journey times, two, three hours, people won't fly that distance, but that's where rail can really compete well with, with road alternatives, whether it's for haulage or for passengers as well. So we need to be focusing on that level of rail journeys if we want to offset carbon. Raider wants to come just, back, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to come on, back with a one question, but only one person is going to get to answer it, I'm and, afraid. And, and really, just on that point, if we're looking at reducing air passenger duty and we're looking at those shorter rail journeys, does that, again, put the balance to flying rather than using rail? You know, again, it's all about the choices, infrastructure choices we make, spending choices we make, uh, cost incentive choices we make. I mean, we, we would say certainly that a, cutting APD when... Uh, air is already, already under, sub, under taxed compared to uh, other transport modes is, is a bad idea and Virgin Trains have come out recently and said particularly on the London to central Scotland routes uh, and potentially London to Aberdeen as well that um, this could be quite devastating for their business if you, if you, you cut what is already an under taxed uh, air alternative to, to rail when they've been building a good rail case over the last 10, 20 years or so. And I'm going to definitely leave that section there and ask Richard, who's been waiting patiently, to, for his question, please. Thank you, Convener. Good morning. Um, basically, I can run to the meeting, one of the Scottish Government's Transport Capital Investment Programme, and Sally Hinchcliffe touched on earlier about A9, and John Finney has touched on A9. In my area, uh, Arrington and Belsall, we're doing the massive uh, M8, M74, M73 upgrade which will actually allow us to go underpass the M74, and it's supposed to open quite shortly. Um, but basically, this trunk road and uh, general you know, sort of traffic upgrade, um, given that it's highly likely that major investment has been made by the Scottish Government in the trunk road uh, network, which it has, will lead to extra miles being driven. Do you agree, or do you, does the Scottish Government's capital investment and transport infrastructure best support its emission uh, reduction ambitions. I'm sure I'll get two Tom, answers on this one. Tom almost launched himself <coughs> out of the seat to get to that one first, so I'll let you go first. <coughs> I suppose uh, a no. Um, <laughs> that's a perfect answer. I mean, the, <laughs> the, the, carbon, uh, the carbon account for Scotland uh, looks at uh, transport projects that are currently under construction or in planning and assesses their carbon impact and we, we see that there's a net increase in carbon emissions projected to arise from all these investments. Not surprisingly, what I would like to know from the Carbon Account of Scotland is whether or not the, the wider land use impacts of those investments are also taken into account in those projections. I suspect that in general they're not and I think that those land use impacts will lead to further journey lengthening, further reliance on the car due to the, these mainly trunk road investment schemes. You know, new development will be attracted to these new junctions and that will mean that people are travelling further and travelling by car more than is modelled even in the carbon account for Scotland. With specific regard to rail electrification, the EGIP scheme, uh, the Edinburgh Glasgow Improvement Programme, uh, it's pushing a billion pound to... Um, electrify between Edinburgh and Glasgow uh, the railway network and uh, unfortunately not to increase the frequency and to reduce the journey time by I don't know, somewhere in the region of seven or eight minutes. Um, this, is, this scheme is projected to reduce carbon emissions because the diesel trains that currently run will be re replaced by electric trains. However, is it a cost effective way of reducing carbon emissions? I would say absolutely not. Uh, although I'm a professor of transport, I think the billion pounds could be better spent on building houses close to affordable, high-quality houses close to where people need to be so they don't have to travel so far, and then they'd be less dependent on carbon-emitting sources of transport. Sally, do you want to come in on that? Well, I think, um, I don't know if you've seen the spokes' submission, which I think went in yesterday, but, I mean, they've looked at the, the balance between trunk road spending versus um, investment in in active travel um, and although uh, we hear a lot about the record levels of investment in cycling that the Scottish Government have done we're not hearing so much about the record levels of investment in trunk roads and I think that does show you know that's four times I think the increase is four times the total of spending on active travel so it, it is it isn't just cutting journey times between cities it's funneling large numbers of cars into town centres and cities which then cause problems elsewhere so 
it's generally uh, something that a small amount of rebalancing of that budget could, could actually have quite a large impact, I think. I did admit to say that, and, and I meant to do it, is there is a cycle, cycle walking tracks, etc. have been built onto the, the M8 uh, upgrade, which I'm sure you'd be quite impressed with. Yes, and, and, and some of those um, trunk road schemes are, are, are very good. Um, one of the things you want to look at, though, is, is more about rather than just running things alongside these trunk roads, basically look at, say, so if you're to say if you're bypassing a town um, or you, you're giving people the option to go past the town, you then take the step at the same time to reduce the traffic within the town by reducing the permeability of the town so that people now have the bypass to use if then going past the town. So it's now not possible or much harder to take your car through the town. And that then unlocks... Um, so, for instance, the Netherlands, which has very high cycling rates, they build a lot of roads. They build very big roads. Um, but when they build a big road around the city, they counteract that with the idea that you now don't drive through that city. You drive to the city, but you don't drive through it. So, and that's the thing that we're not doing. We're just building the road part. And we may be putting nice cycling infrastructure in. We're improving trunk road connections that way. But we're not... Um, looking at the whole picture again. So if you, if you drive along the A75, where I live in near Dumfries, um, a very nice cycle path appears, and which joins one dairy farm to another, because that was the bit of road that got widened. So obviously that cycle path is completely useless. I, I know that uh, Tom Wright wants to come back in, and, and Sally, you actually hot on a subject I was thought I might not, might not ask, but I will. My mother-in-law was Dutch. I went to Holland, my wife and I have been in Holland quite a number of times and have cycled, not a lot, but cycled around um, um, basically Appledorn uh, and various other places that my brother-in-law worked at. And how do, maybe Tom when he's coming back in, how does uh, Dutch emissions compare to Scottish? Taking that they have, it's over there, you have to see it to believe it, the massive amount of bikes but as you say, the infrastructure is geared to that um, because, it, again, the land is quite flat. Uh, Tom, before you come in, because uh, I see Sally's wanting to come in, um, is, is there anyone else who wants to come in on, on, the, on the previous point? If not, I'll, I'll bring you in, Tom, <coughs> Sally, and then I've got to move on to the next question, if I may. So, okay. Tom. Uh, with regards to the Netherlands, um, I think their, their transport emissions per capita are lower, but they're still growing. And the reason for that, that they're growing is because there's increasing car use in, in the Netherlands. In spite of all that fantastic uh, cycling infrastructure, there's an awful lot of road infrastructure as well. And also there are housing price issues, which mean that people have to travel along long distances to work by car and by train. Um, could I just raise the point of the, the investment in trunk roads and its wider impact? The justification, the government justification for investment in trunk roads is to reduce journey times and therefore increase economic growth. Whilst that's a compelling theoretical argument, the empirical evidence for that actually occurring is very, very difficult to establish at a country level. So if you cut journey times, you don't necessarily uh, increase economic growth. On the, on the other hand, if you cut journey times, you make car travel cheaper, and that will encourage more car travel, and we know that that therefore inc increases carbon emissions. So um, the, the, this automatically assumed link between cutting journey times and improved trunk roads or improved railways and increased economic growth at the country level the empirical evidence to, to support that is really not there. Sally. Just, I just wanted, to, I reacted to the, the Netherlands is flat arguments. <laughs> um, yes, it is flat. It's also quite windy, um, which yeah. if, you, if you cycle a lot is, is almost as bad. But um, the, the, the correlation between cycling rates and um, is, is, if you look at all the factors that diff different cities have and, and how, how much people cycle in them, the correlation has got nothing to do with weather, terrain, um, even size or density. The one thing that comes out is length of cycling infrastructure. So it's just correlation is not causation, but there's a very strong case for the fact that it's the cycle paths in the Netherlands that make people cycle and yeah. not the flatness. Yeah. Yeah. With, this next, uh, with the next question from me. Thank you, Camille. Good morning. <laughs> um, the draft climate change plan, to me, is all about behavioural change. Um, it's, it's about getting people to change behaviour. Um, 
and to do that, the best way to do that is positive reinforcement rather than negative reinforcement. In other words, the, the carrot rather than the stick. And it surprised me this morning that, um, by and large, I know we've touched on public transport, touched on buses, touched on rail. The, 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 the discussion, the questions and answers has very much been orientated to, to private transport as opposed to public transport. Um, if I could just put, put to you, there are some environmental and health benefits from moving people, uh, especially in our cities, to um, public transport. There are 1.3 million Scots who have the free bus card, the bus travel pass. 70,000 Scots every year come into receiving that travel card. Um, do you agree with me that if we could get people to, you know, we talk about reducing car use and um, cutting journey times and whatever, but if we, had, if we actually managed to get people to leave their cars at home and do without the car in, in a lot of cases altogether by using it more on these bus passes, then surely this has to be a good thing for the environment, reduce uh, emissions, and for people's health. It's a, surely a win-win situation altogether, is it not? David. Uh, if those buses are low emission buses, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So um, I think we need to be aware of the fact that air quality problems in cities are quite often attributed to buses rather than to private cars. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And um, it when you think about the fact that these are high mileage vehicles, uh, which um, uh, are quite energy intensive and produce quite a lot of emissions, clearly diesel buses driving around in cities today is a problem. Um, there are ambitions around decarbonising buses. I think one of the important things to bear in mind here is um, the replacement cycles for these vehicles. So the, the average age of a bus in Scotland, I think, is um, over eight years old. Mm -hmm. And the average replacement cycle for a bus is about 10 to 15 years. So if we're to hit targets in the future, we need to make quite rapid progress in, in decarbonising the buses in our fleet. Mm -hmm. um, so the answer is yes, more people on buses are good, is a good thing mm -hmm. if they are low carbon right. buses. Okay. Do, does anyone else want to come in on that? Tom? Um, I think it, public transport is part of the answer. Improved public transport, of course, and improved alternatives are part of, part of the answer. Uh, <coughs> however, I, I th they're, they're, they're not the whole solution, no. as has been alluded to before. It's very, very important to have a package in, 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 of measures to tackle climate to tackle emissions. Emissions from transport are a function of trip length. They're a function of the carbon intensity of the fuel. They're a function of uh, the, the, uh, the vehicle technology, and they're a function of the mode of transport that's used, all those things. Um, if we want to focus on mode shift, if we want to bring about mode shift, yeah, improve the alternatives, but I'm afraid all the evidence suggests that there's a need also to make car use a little bit more difficult. I'll give you an example of where that hasn't been done. Madrid, the city of Madrid, experienced very high population growth, I'll grant you, but in about in the last 15, 20 years, they've increased their metro network. The length has increased from around about 150 kilometres of metro to around about 250 kilometres of metro, and they've also improved their suburban railway network at the same time. But they improved their motorway network, didn't in introduce any demand management measures. Mode shift there's been no mode shift. You know, you've had this incredible improvement to the public transport system, but at the same time, no other measures to make car use more difficult. And so, the, the mode split is the same as as it was. Um, so, I think that has to be borne in mind that if you only improve public transport without dealing, without making car use a little bit more inconvenient, then the pe the new passengers on public transport will be people who have been attracted from walk or bike primarily. And the interesting thing is that you raise that, but I wonder if the perspective is right, because I mean, uh, I come from a very rural area, mm. a lot of us in this particular committee come from rural areas, mm. um, and very often there's no real alternative to the car out mm. in, I mean, I live 30 miles from Aberdeen, for instance, mm. seven miles from the nearest village, and we have a bus that passes, I don't know how many times, I mean, it just, just can't use it, because they're just not frequent enough. Mm. Um, the problem is, if you make bus transport more attractive, I mean, I'm not just talking about the cities. I mean, as I say, 1.3 million of us have these cards already. Um, you could improve rural transport by making it more, 
more efficient by expanding. At the moment, it's just for six people aged 60 or over with disabilities. Yeah. I know the government's looking at improving it for the younger people. Um, if you expanded the, the, the process and got more people to use the buses and made it more attractive in a positive way, you don't necessarily have to go at it from a negative perspective. Don't you um, think? Do you agree with that or not? Does, do, does any, Tom, do you want to come back on I, that? I have, uh, a, I have a, a valid... Well, okay. I have a valid point. I'm sure all my points have been valid. Sorry. I have a relevant sure piece of... quantifies your a, previous response. A relevant piece sure. of evidence. I mean, I think we're talking here about long-term elasticity effects in, 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 in response to an improvement in uh, service or a change in price. Um, That's what I meant to say. Yeah. <laughs> in the example of South Yorkshire many years ago, in 1972, they froze their bus fares. Um, at 1972 levels and they didn't put them up until 1986 at bus deregulation and the long term effect of that was to reduce car ownership and car use and driving licence acquisition amongst young people but they had a level of service as well and there was a cost associated with it. In the rural Aberdeenshire case I think it would be more difficult to bring that about purely through price and improvement in bus service simply because um, in rural areas it's, it's it's difficult, it's very difficult and very expensive to provide an attractive bus service that can be, you know, even halfway as attractive as the, as the private car, simply because of the distribution of population and the distribution of destinations. Um, but in, in the long term, if one were willing to put enough resource in, then probably one could bring about a public transport system in a rural area that were as attractive as a car, but there would be a big price tag attached to it, definitely. I, th I think that's... Uh, do you want to follow no, that? No. Because but I think it's a valid point. In some cases, there are places where you, mm. you can get a bus to, to, to somewhere to have a meeting to find that you have to stay on the bus to get home, so you've got no time for the meeting because of the frequency of the services. The final question, if I may, to the Deputy Convener, Gail. Thank you, Convener, and I'd just like to thank you all very much. It was a really interesting session. We touched on a lot of different topics, um, there have been mentions about RPP2 and the differences between the two plans. Uh, we talked about a, a lack of detail, land use, various different um, points. But just so that we as a committee can capture it succinctly, do you have any detail of a lack of any kind of policy that you would have preferred to have seen in the plan that is currently not here? And I'm, I'm I think that's a really good question, so I'm going to go along the line, if I may, and give you all a chance to, to and if I may limit you to, to one, I know there isn't a silver bullet to solve all the problems, but if we could start with one from each of you, that would be very helpful. Phil, would you like to? Uh, yes, I think, as we said in our submission, um, workplace parking levies, it, it is in there, but it's not there as a clear policy. We'd very much like to see that taken forward in a, a more active way by the Scottish Government and by local authorities as well. Okay, Tom. I may simply have missed it, and it may be there, but if it's not, I would say land use, crucial in controlling or influencing trip length in a positive direction. Sally? Uh, mode, mode shift to away from the private car, um, and, and including public transport, which was very strong in the climate conversations, but doesn't seem to have come through to the plan at all. Okay, David? I'm just going to underline Tom's point about land use and planning, because I think uh, where we live and where we work and where we travel to is, is a huge part of this. Okay, Jason. Well, it's difficult to point to, to one thing, especially with freight, it's much more private sector driven, so the government perhaps has even less control over that or influence than it does uh, with, with passenger transport. So I don't really have anything to add. It's more about perhaps adding a little more teeth to the ones that are in there, such as consolidation centres and low emission zones and also the long, longer freight trains, which is in here. But again, it's that issue of how much you want to spend on it. But I would probably say, yeah, longer, longer trains is, is the one, the key policy there. Okay. Can, I, can, I, can I echo Gail's comments? Thank you very much. It, it's appropriate that we spend a, a very large amount of time on this subject of transport because it is the area that perhaps needs the biggest change to be made over, over the other sectors that we've done. So I, I would like to thank you on behalf of the committee for, for attending this morning and would say to you that if there are matters, if you feel that I've cut you off when there's something that you want to say, but if there are matters that uh, you want to feed into the committee, there is still time, but not much time, and I would ask you to give those uh, to, the, to the clerk uh, as, as soon as you can after this meeting. So thank you very much for, for attending.
and uh, I'd briefly like to suspend the meeting uh, to allow the witnesses to leave. Thank you.
Uh, the third item on the agenda is the consideration of the Plant Health Import Inspection Fees Scotland Amendment Regulations 2017. This instrument is subject to a negative procedure. The committee should now consider any issues it wishes to raise in reporting to the Parliament on this uh, issue. Members should note that no motions to annul have been received in relation to these instruments. There have also been no representations to the committee on these instruments. Does any members of the committee have any comments on them? So is the committee agreed that it dis does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to these instruments? Agreed. That is agreed then. Uh, now I'm going to suspend the meeting to allow the committee to move into private session. Thank you.